Hello and welcome to Connecting with the Stars here with me, Mary Edwards and Jocelyn Buckner. Great to see you today. And good nice to, to be you here. here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Um, so the, we'll do a quick bio and then we can hear some of uh, Jocelyn's amazing story. She's had a fascinating background doing many different things and we'll tap on a lot of that today. So Jocelyn Buckner is a lifelong UFO experiencer. Before retiring, she was a paranormal UFO tour guide, UFO researcher, intuitive, and quantum healer. She is a writer, artist, photographer, and longtime Sedona resident. Resident, And she has really been in the weave of all the layers of Sedona for the last 22 years. And also, it's been fascinating hearing about her property that she bought. So why don't you start out with that and then we can talk about all some of your own experiences and just go enjoy the day talking about this time together, talking about your amazing background and what you've done. Okay. Oh, great. Um, I live on a original Disney property. He purchased this property years ago uh, because he was going to do a movie about a uh, disclosure, actually, President Eisenhower uh, approached him and said that he wanted to disclose to the American public what they what the government knew about UFOs. And they were going to have Marilyn Monroe and Mickey Mouse as the ambassador to the stars. And uh, so Disney said, yeah, I'm very interested. And and uh, Disney said, well, here, take this film that that is from uh, our Department of Energy. And uh, it was original, the kind of film that they use that you have to run it and take a photo of it running to make copies. So this was the original film that uh, somebody in the military had filmed right here probably a stone's throw from where i'm sitting excuse um, me what year, what, what, what year about would there decade would this have been because oh it was that was um uh 1949 that original film was a film and uh you know it, actually they the government came here because there was a lot of films being made in Sedona at that time that were Westerns and, you know, John Wayne and, and all those guys. And there was one time that John Wayne and, and uh, Maureen O'Hare were in a film, in a, you know, in a scene and they were filming it and you could see the camera was on them. And then the camera panned up and it was watching a UFO and meanwhile down <laughs> you know they kept on acting and and for a long time that um little clip was at the uh the museum the movie museum that's in uptown here but it disappeared sometime in the early 80s nobody knows whatever happened to it it just yeah gone um I fortunately did have a chance to see that when before I moved to Sedona, and I was here just visiting and uh, went into the movie museum and and uh, they they were sort of featuring it. And um, uh, so anyway, the government came here. They purchased a property that is nearby is now Forest Service land. And it's right near Red Rock Loop, uh, Loop Road and Red Rock State Park. And, uh, but it's off a little bit on the other side of Turkey Creek. And uh, this is actually the portal area that is mentioned in the Rendlesham case uh, in 1980 by Jim Burroughs and, and John I mean, John Burroughs and Jim Tennyson, who actually saw a UFO come down and Jim went over, put his hands on it. He was downloaded with ones and zeros 
those ones mm -hmm. and zeros were later um they were later put out and and deciphered by Claude Swanson and um, uh, Dr. Claude Swanson and this other guy, I can't remember his name, um, but they got several messages out of that. And one of the messages was the seven places on the planet where there were portals where UFOs were coming in. And that one portal is out my door um, and to the south a little bit. So I I see a lot of UFOs and, and people come here all the time looking for UFOs. But the, the government came here, they made the the um the film, they gave the film to Disney. Disney came out and purchased this as a part of the Chavez Ranch property and the Sherman uh, property it's kind of you know dissected there uh, and he bought a big sw swath of land out here and his cover was that he was um, doing nature photos for the wonderful world of Disney or uh, filming Spin and Marty or the Mickey Mouse Club and he used this property out here Disney built his house in uh West Sedona, uh, near Thunder Mountain, pretty much where the stupa is now. And they actually had a little western town that they built, you know, just that were the fronts uh, for for movies that they did out there. And it was, you know, um, a tourist attraction at that time. Um, but he would come down here to watch the UFOs and work on on that project. But he told, um, and Disney told Eisenhower, well, you know, I'm working on doing a, um, a, a park, opening a park. I've got, you know, Fantasia I'm working on, and Snow White, these movies. And, and as soon as I get that done, I'm going to start working on the disclosure program. And uh, all of this was told to me by a neighbor who was a little old lady when I moved in here 22 years ago, and she has since passed away. But she was a makeup artist and um, and hairstylist, costume person for several different movie companies that came out here. And she had built the house that is right at the end of my street. And uh, you know, I used to see her all the time when I was out there a very flamboyant woman with bright red hair and, and she always wore leopard skin clothes and, and she was just, you know, really great. And there's one time she invited me into her house and she goes, I want to tell you about how Disney and, and there's a street in the neighborhood that is named Disney Lane. She goes, I want to, I want to tell you about how that street got its name and, and, you know, the history of your uh, property here. And uh, so I sat on her couch and scribbling on just about anything that, you know, old envelopes and, and junk mail and a piece of paper towel at, at the very end of it. So I wouldn't forget the things that, that she was telling me. And so this is how I got the story of Disney being a uh, involved in the disclosure project. But you know, Eisenhower left office and JFK came in. He picked up the project. He wanted to go with it. And then we know what happened to JFK, and that was the end of the project. Uh, and then later, um, sometime in the late 70s, the uh, government went back to Disney and said, yeah, about that film that we gave you, um, we want it back. And Disney said, no, I didn't do it. And, and and they said, oh, and by the way, we want all the film that you took too. And he goes, oh no, that's mine. And uh, they went back and forth for a few years. And some, I want to say, sometime in 1978 or 79, um, the little cabin that he built in the area uh, for his filming 
burned to the ground. And this little cabin they used uh, for the people that work for Disney, you know, camera people and, and stuff, they actually live there, sort of like a little bunkhouse. And it burned to the ground. And uh, after it burned to the ground, uh, Disney was notified and said, yeah, we know where you live. Give us that film back. And uh, Disney suffered a heart attack and the first of many, and eventually he gave up the, the film. So, you know, and the project was ended. And, uh, you know, he had to sign away all rights to uh, the film that he had taken in case that there were any copies. But anyway, um, this uh, area is just really lousy with UFOs and, and weird things that happen. And uh, when I, I have the guest house, I'm in my guest house right now. And I invited my friend, Melinda Leslie, to come out. She had an idea to do um, tours with night vision goggles to spy on the UFOs. And I said, it's really great. Person that was doing it here, one guy, Tom Dongo, who's retiring. Um, and then the lady that was that kind of picked up had the old UFO shop, and she was very sick with uh, brain cancer, and so she was closing her shop. And I said, you know, you're just in the perfect time. And at the time, I was working at the Center for the New Age, so I introduced Melinda to the owner there so that she could, uh, you know, set up her business. But while she was here, and this was in November, uh, first part of November, and uh, you know the leaves were still on the ground, and I invited her to spend the night in the guest house, or you know, or a, she ended up staying like a week. And uh, her and her friend Bonnie, who was a very heavy smoker, uh, were staying here, and. Well, one night things got very weird. I woke up um, and I saw uh, a couple of ETs walking through the wall and, you know, coming right up to my bed and saying, you know, okay, well, it's time to go. And uh, usually I have a dog that just anything that moves in the night, she would just, and I looked down and, uh, you know, where she was sleeping and she was absolutely paralyzed. I could see her, her one eye that, you know, she's leaning on her side. And I see her one eye moving around. That she couldn't move. And I told the EPs, well, you know, it's cold outside. Um, I want to put on some sweats. So they allowed me to put on some sweats. And of course, it was laundry day. I couldn't find any. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I had to dig around and quickly put on these sweats. And I had put them on backwards because it was in the night and I was hurrying. But um, I went out my door, uh, got a, a bedroom door that goes to outside. And as soon as I went out there, I saw an egg-shaped craft uh, that was like a single person, uh, egg-shaped craft. And apparently I've known all about this because I, I knew how to get in it and and then it would just go up and it followed uh, Red Rock Loop Road, uh, the upper Red Rock Loop Road to the high school. And, um, you know, it, I got out of it and, and I saw Melinda, I saw Bonnie, and uh, I, I recognized, actually, I recognized them because I could hear Bonnie's hacking cough. And, uh, and then I saw Melinda, and, and then I saw um, my family was there also, my husband. Uh, so there, there was this uh, bus there, and it kind of looked like a short bus, and it was kind of a light color, and uh, went to go get on the bus, and it was you know, from the outside it looked very short, but on the inside it looked huge. I mean, I not even sure if I saw the end of it, but there were lots of people there, uh, you know. Uh, 
hundred or so people. And they were all <laughs> very sweet so uh conking out. And it was seemed like it was only me and, and Melinda um that were very conscious. And it was you know, we sat out front and Melinda was just mad as heck and she was going to call her friend Les Valdez who pulls out her her cell phone out of, out of the pocket of her jacket and she's beeping along I'm going to call I'm going to call and she's just so mad that she goes they're okay if they take me but they're not going to take my friends kind of thing and uh, this ET just sort of floated over and plucked the, the cell phone from her uh, hands and uh, she it was, she said that she later found it in the guest house under mm. a pillow or something. But um, yeah, it was, it, it was pretty funny. And then while we're, we're waiting, they kept on flashing these symbols at us. And, uh, and we took this road out, um, a very familiar road, that you take to go to Bradshaw Ranch and Road 525. And uh, then they veered off onto a dirt road and it looked like we were going straight for a Red Rock Mountain. And all of a sudden, the mountain opened up. It just, you know, the rocks just dissipated and, and it just opened up, it just parted. And the bus rolled in there and we got off. And at this point, um, I think we were separated into groups of some sort and we were taken to a mothership that was over Flagstaff. Uh, and as soon as we got up to that mothership, we came in and there was this catwalk and we could look down and see these silver beds with people in various states of undress um, being, you know, examined by these ETs. But uh, lots of hybrids on the, um, on the craft, and they were sort of our uh, tour guides, uh, our stewardesses, or stewards, as you could say. Um, and they took us to another part um of the room now at this point uh you know melinda and i were both regressed by um yvonne smith and uh, about this um happening um so you know we're telling yvonne the same story but it to me it seemed like we were in this you know, we might have been taken back to the underground base because it seemed very um, government green building with tile floors and, and uh, you know, the lights, dated, uh, dated, lights dated, and and flickered yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Outdated. Um, Dry out. And uh, yeah, and we went into this room and we were sat at these uh, chairs that were like you know in a college they have these uh chairs that have a uh, guest that, yep. that that flip over yeah a little and so we're sitting in the back and um these uh the the wall kind of opens up and you see this uh chair there with you know some sort of apparatus on it and a lot of, you know, maybe five, six ETs scurrying about uh, different kinds. Most of them were grays, but there were, uh, I did notice a uh, kind of a insectoid kind of uh, being. Um, or like a, a praying mantis. Praying mantis. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but the ones that we were interacting with were like tall whites or Pleiadian. Um, and they were eight feet or something yeah. like that. And blue skin? They were, blue yeah, they were, they were a, a, yeah, very thin, translucent skin, long blonde hair, very beautiful. Um, I want to say that the, they were about seven feet tall. Yeah. They, you know, they, uh, they, they could have passed for humans. And, um, but they had to sit down uh, in this 
chair. They called they called me first, and I I could hear Melinda and uh, Bonnie in the back. Bonnie again with the top. I knew that they were there, and Melinda's voice is she's just a booming voice, and it carries. So uh, uh, I call was called up, and I sat down. And uh, there was a table, and it had like this uh, ring on, you know, uh, an open ring. And on one side of the table was uh, this thing that was pyramid shape or a kind of a rounded pyramid uh, shape, uh, like a fat teardrop. And uh, then on the other side, there were... Uh, like a grid uh, that, and all of this looked like it was made of some sort of a golden type metal or maybe brass. And um, they put this thing on her head and, you know, the kind of a skull cap with uh, electrodes that were attached. And they said, okay, well, what we want you to do is not using your hands or you know without touching we want you to pick up that that little teardrop thing or that little pyramid thing and move it through the hoop and make it go to the other side and they did some sort of mind mill thing and they to teach us how to do it and so you know that because at first i thought <laughs> telekinesis yeah sure uh but, uh, you know, at one point, uh, they, while you were doing, it's kind of like riding a bike, you know, how your mom would run along the side of the bike when you were first learning and, and hold you up, and then they would let go, and you're riding along, you're like, wow, I'm doing it. I'm, same, same kind of thing. They helped us pick it up, and then at some point, after two or three times of doing this, they and they told us where to put it down on the grid on the other side and uh after two or three times i could i i got it, it you know i rode the bike i could i could move it you know back and forth and um uh, so they they took me out and uh i i went and i was talking to somebody and they were asking like you know I know, you know, what is your name? What is your date of birth? You know, what's, what's your blood type? Um, kind of, you know, really clinical uh, kind of, of thing. And while I, I'm outside the room, I could hear Bonnie's voice that said, you know, she's kind of coughing away saying, you're kidding me. You want me to do what? I haven't slept in three days. And you want me to move that thing with my mind. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. So, uh, so they took her out and uh, they took her down a different corridor than I, you know, I didn't even realize was there. And then I went back and sat in the back of the room and uh, they brought Melinda up. And of course, Melinda was hanging it back and forth uh, you know, perfectly. And Melinda looked around to me and, and she saw me in the back of the room and I gave her the thumbs up. She gave me the thumbs up and, and then we were taken out and, uh, put along a, a bench area. And, um, at that point, my backwards clothes were really bothering me. Now on the, the <laughs> On the bus over, I was able, you know, to pull my sleeves in and, and get my uh, shirt turned around. But my pants were really bothering, and I had that big bulge, you know, right in my crotch, and I really wanted to go and, and move it. So this one uh, hybrid woman with bright red hair came by, and I said, um, "Excuse me, do you have a a restroom?" I <laughs> could use like. You know, so I could, uh, you know, now you're just thinking, I, I'll just turn my my uh, pants around and go in the restroom. 
And she said, sure, you have to follow me, but I'm doing my rounds. So, you know, um, you'll, you know, I, I have to make a couple of stops. And as we're walking through this area, one of the areas that she went to was, um, it was like a zoo and there were different pods and, you know, with barricades around them. And I, I remember she told me, okay, well, just stop here. And, and uh, it was right in front of this um, exhibit, I say, something that uh, had a very low uh, fence around it. And inside, it kind of looked like something that reminded me of coral, but it had the um, frequency of a dog. You know, it, was, it, it seemed, <laughs> It seemed conscious and it seemed friendly, you know. I could see it wagging back and forth, you know, when you know, I would get up close and, and uh, you know, I went back up and I could even hear it kind of squeaking. And uh, uh, and then I walked by some others, you know, following her. And there were different kinds. I want to say that this must have been some sort of uh, plant life that had some sort of consciousness to it. So it was and an experimental, it was, it was a laboratory yes. that was walking by sort of that you were seeing. I don't know if, if it was experimental or, or if it were just uh, samples, samples okay. of, uh, that they had uh, collected. And it's, you know, because it seemed like this, what, this hybrid woman was checking on them or feeding them or, you know, or something. Um, you know, she would, uh, uh, several of them, she, she would turn a light on and, and or, or, you know, or she walked up, a light would come on and, um, and, you know, you could see what was under, some of them were underwater or under some sort of thick gel, if some fits. But anyway, I get to, I get to the restroom and it's like, you know, the restroom that you had in high school. And, you know, with the, uh, that, that green Greeny, and that, yeah. that pile and those Data, uh, yeah. fluorescent lights and, you know, the thing that you press your, your foot on the pedal and the water came out of the middle of it, um, like a canister and, and, you know, the paper towel dispenser, all just, you know, just like that. But I was able to to fix my pants and and uh, relieve myself and and walk back out and then there was an, a guy that was just outside and he was wearing some sort of uh, uniform that looked like um, a military uniform and now I couldn't tell you know what military. Uh, it, it, there was no flags, there was no name on it or anything like that, but it was obviously a military uniform with the epaulets and, you know, the, uh, the, the gold buttons with, you know, some sort of little embossed. So he was, human. he was a human, he was human. He was, he was human and, um, did he talk but to you again, to talk to you about he it. said he goes yeah he goes yes i need you to follow me and from there they took me to a debriefing room where i sat across um a table and i remember that this was absolutely military because there was a uh, name tag on the table that said captain so and so and i couldn't remember what the name was even in regression but I remember Captain, so I know that that he was somebody that was in charge, and he was debriefing me, and you know, it's like, what did you feel? You know, uh, were you, you know, did you feel the the electrodes, or did you feel the the ET energies, and you know, and and basic questions like that that you would expect, and um, you know, but my questions when I answered like, well, yeah, who was that? What was that for? And, you know, right. <laughs> right. were they putting information, you in with this information? 
dump, uh, right? Because I yeah. remember that at 10 when I, did, I had some of those. It was just those weird things on your head and you, you know, and it was like, what yeah. are you doing? Like, right, right. I, yeah, and I remember that from from they told me my, my collective mm -hmm. family said those was information and stats and math and info to help improve my you know who yeah. i was that they that they do right yes yeah so after the debriefing i went and went out sat on a a bench um again i had the feeling that we were aboard a ship at that time um and uh uh, I could hear Melinda's voice and Melinda was in that room and she was going through the same debriefing and then uh, it, it, Melinda came out and sat on on the um, the bench as well. Now I started to tell you that when we were on our on this uh, bus that we kept on seeing these different shapes and then the shapes would kind of come together like a puzzle piece. And, you know, I watched them for a while um, and I, I didn't realize that that was also part of an experiment. And, you know, there was some place that, um, that we were taken and we were told to find, you know, the, the shape that matched. And of course we were shown those on the bus coming over. So if you were paying attention, it was a pretty easy thing. And I remember because Melinda and I were still conscious and we were talking about it. So, you know, for the both of us, it was like, you know, it, it, it kind of reminded me of that game 10 grams where, you know, they give you a, a, a shape matched and then you have all these other shapes that you got to put together to make that shape. And uh, so it was sort of like that. And then back to the uh, to the bench and this other uh, ET, uh, it was a, a gray ET that came over and, and what had size a tray. Was, sorry, was he a light gray, blue gray, dark gray? Because I saw little four foot ones. What size and color were you? Yeah, they were, they were about, they were about four foot, uh, three and a half to four foot. Uh, I would say short. We were sitting, the eyes so, and the so we were sitting on this bench, and they were, you know, eye, eye level. Uh, with uh, eye level, and and um, you know, just the typical gray that that you know you always see photos of, and I mean uh, drawings of, and uh, with the big eyes and and the ridge, the ridges on the head, and um. Uh, I uh, uh, they, he had a little tray, and and the tray had the Dixie cups with the pink thick substance, and um, you know I I picked it up and just gulped it down. Melinda said, "Yeah, I'm going to pass this time." Oh, and, so she didn't. Ah, interesting. Well, she she resisted. Let's just say she resisted. And um, this, the original woman that brought us in uh, with the red hair, uh, ET hybrid, came over and said, well, you can either take it or we can shoot it into your neck, it, you know, but you're not getting out of here without it. And so then the goes, okay, well, and she'd take a little sip. That it's better if you just... You know, you like Jocelyn and just down the whole thing, down the hatch. So I, she looked at me and I looked at her and I went like that, you know, to show her that I was already starting to feel the effects of it. And Melinda laughed and laughed and then she took it. And then the next day, now here's another thing. I have this deal with the ETs that they can take me. I don't care. I, I mean, this is, uh, it's happened through my life. They can take me, but they must give me something tangible, leave me with something that proves that they've taken me um, so that I know that I'm not crazy or it's not just a dream. But you know, I, I've just started doing material. that and they're doing it now, yeah. but I didn't 
think of asking that my whole life because I didn't start talking about this really to anybody. Yeah, Unless, well, this started you know, when I was about I mean, eight. Yeah, and yeah. now they're showing me pictures of the, some of the, the, you know, more things, but I'm, I'm now asking. Oh, I've, I've got a whole box of, of rocks and, and crystals and, uh, you know, mm. of leaves and pine cones and stuff that um, I have found after being uh, taken. This time, they left a crop circle made of those um, colored leaves. And... Where was this the crop morning, circle at your near your house? Out, uh, outside my bedroom door. How big was uh, it? What shape was it? That's so cool. Uh, it was about, it wasn't very big. The interesting thing is, it's like toward the side of my house. And this was where I used the dog run. And there's mostly just gravel out there, you know, kind of red rock, little pebbles. And uh, I have a couple of, uh, peach trees out there and, and then there, the neighbor had a big cottonwood tree so there was lots of these very colorful leaves that were uh, you know out there kind of blown up against the fence um, and in the morning it looked like they were braided they were so beautifully braided in a, a circle that was probably eight nine feet in diameter and in the middle there was uh, a uh i can't remember they're called orange globe uh but it was a weed a, you know a wild flower that had been bent and it looked like a, you know something that you would have as a centerpiece of your in your table it was it was you know just done up beautifully with this braided mm. leaves all around it and this is the dog run there were lots of dog drawings out there wasn't a single one <laughs> it was wow. completely clean and, and i said it was did, worth it just how for long that. Did that just, and how long did that last i mean is that is still a well, uh, area or is that now uh, well you know the next the next morning uh Melinda came over and, you know, it's really early in the morning and we started talking. I, and I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want anybody to be frightened or, or scared, but I knew, uh, even though I didn't remember in all this much detail, I didn't remember until after I had been regressed by Yvonne Smith, it was, you know, everything that had happened that I just told you. But I knew that something was up first of all when i got up in the morning my uh, um, walk-in closet looked like somebody it had some sort of explosion oh you're breaking up a little bit so yeah i, I lost you for a minute yeah um again i've got full bars that's and, okay let's um, just keep going let's just keep going and okay. maybe we'll go you know till okay. we can't go anymore so, but. so i i told you that i in the morning when i woke up i looked at my i was getting dressed and i looked in my closet um and it just looked like there was an explosion I, you know all the things that were taken out of the dirty clothes uh, um the pamper in there and Clothes were taken off the hammer and it camped to the hangers and they were thrown about. And, and I thought I must have been looking for something, you know, and of course I was looking for sweats to put on. Um, and the next day, my dog was just really clinging and this dog loved Melinda. And when Melinda came over in the morning, uh, my dog Emily went over and uh, put her paws up on Melinda's shoulders and was going, woo, 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 woo. and I was thinking, God, she never what does she that. Saying, right? She's never having this, wow. this conversation with, with Melinda. It's like, what happened to you last night? Kind of thing. Uh, and but she was being extra clingy. Whenever I, I stood too long, she would come over and literally sit on my feet. Um, but I was making coffee and, you know, getting breakfast, putting together. And Melinda said, you know, I think they're, 
I think I had a UFO sighting last night. And then I could hear, I could smell the cigarette smoke. So I knew that that Bonnie was up. She, the first thing she did was walk outside and light up her cigarette. And uh, I said, well, you know, tell Bonnie to come over. And Bonnie came over and she goes, we had a big UFO sighting last night. She said, I, the, uh, of the whole room lit up and I looked through the mini blinds and, you know, it was just lit up uh, clear as day. And I looked up there and there was a egg-shaped craft. And I went, oh. An egg-shaped, like, like a rival kind of shape? Yeah, like, no, like, uh, like, a, like an egg. Right. That's only big. Yeah. And um uh, and she said, Yeah, you know, uh, I think I think uh you know something happened. And Melinda said under her breath, Yeah, I think we were taken. And at that moment, my husband said, Honey, why don't you come here and look out the window? And I went to the bedroom and and I looked out the window and I saw the, the crop circle wow. and and <laughs> so Melinda and I uh, wow. ran out there and um you know Melinda is a UFO researcher and so she you know, she pulled up the the centerpiece she, uh, well first she took lots of photos she did measurements and she said that she wanted to come back later you know with um, something that would scan the the ground for um, frequencies and you know, you know like this, whatever. Um, but but uh, she had taken soil samples and had taken the the centerpiece, which was interesting. That somewhere along the line, she said that they disappeared. Like she had them, and but she was moving from. Uh, Orange County, California, to Sedona, and someplace in the moon. All that stuff got misplaced, but we uh, do still have the photographs of it. Uh, and so, you know, had all of that. And uh, again, uh, we were talking about it, and I said, you know what, uh, next month, is uh, UFO Congress, and I know that Yvonne Smith is going to be there. Let's not solely each other's stories of what we think that happened. We'll just go and get regressed. And so Yvonne Smith um, did regress Bonnie and I uh, and Melinda, and we all told the same story. So. You validated you know it. That it, it was, it, it, yeah. But and, that's unbelievable uh, that you got to go with two friends and have that experience together. I mean, I went up on the craft the first time from 72 as of a couple of days ago, and I went at five. And not until the last four months that I've been talking to my father, who passed eight years ago because he was involved in the government and the you know military and stuff for his whole life with his father's big company and his company. And only I've only learned about this, I mean, through him, like in the last few months. So I've gone through my whole life being feeling completely crazy because he was told to keep his trap shut because he was working with all those, the, you know, the Navy and the blah, blah. And, um, but I, if I had had that experience with other, if he had been able to tell me that, or my mom would have shared to me, because I'm sure he told her, but they weren't allowed to talk about it. But to have that validation, and I, you know, I had a regression with Barbara Lamb and a couple other people, I knew you can't make that up. I mean, but you, for you to be able to have the validation with close friends at the same time is just really amazing, right? And then to be able to, um, and how long ago was that? When did that happen? When was, the, when did you get taken with your friend? Um, uh, that was in November of 2009. 2009, okay. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, have you under up a lot since then, because I've been going ever since. Have you do you continue to go up and and do? Uh, not not as often as I did. I mean, it to me it comes in waves, and you know, for for a while, uh, like when I was a kid, my mom used to take me out to George Van Tassel's spaceship convention, and um, 
you I've know, seen I pictures just, of really, that. I can't believe next to the mountain with all those. I mean, that looked unbelievable. What was yeah. that? How old were you then? I don't remember when that was. Was that the fifties or something? Um, yeah, that was that was in the fifties. Uh, probably, you know. Uh, I went out in the late fifties. I know that she went out there a couple of times before I was born, or while she was pregnant with me, and that would have been nineteen fifty three, fifty four. Uh, and uh, uh, but you know later, let's say. You know, because it wasn't it wasn't like every year like they do conferences that now. Uh, George Van Tassel had a radio program when and when he would make these announcements that they were going to show up, then he would have his spaceship. Right, I heard, I've heard about it. Yeah, heard yeah, and yeah, just thousands of people bigger than any of any of the conferences I've ever been. To. And when um, did that end? I mean, did that end when? I mean, um, well, George Van Tassel was discredited um, by a New York lo uh, lawyer. And uh, back then, there was no such thing as Photoshop. But um, George Van Tassel would describe what the craft looked like. And this guy that was a lawyer was also working with uh, military, probably the CIA, and uh, somehow had doctored or or maybe even gotten some uh, photographs of of the craft that George Van Tassel was seeing. And uh, one time during one of these spaceship conventions uh, uh, in the early sixties, um, the lawyers made an appointment to see George Van Tassel. And he showed them these photographs and George Van Tassel went, oh my God, how did she get these photographs? This is, you know, exactly what I'm seeing. And I've never been able to, you know, they've never allowed a photograph. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 this is just great. And the lawyer said, so you will authenticate it that these, these are real photographs. And he said, of course, you know, this is, you know, this is amazing, and you know, can I get a coffee? And this is, you know, he was just going on and on. And then, uh, after George Van Tassel authenticated him, talked about him on his radio show, the lawyer came out and went, Nana, 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 I was lying, those are fake. And you know, oh, it just missed Hollywood, the God, you know, yeah. just some, yeah. um, it completely debunked him. And um, there were other things, uh, you know, even about Frank Kritzer with the, you know, who had lived underneath the, um, made, originally made the home underneath Giant Rock. And that those information were not true, but they were being widely circulated that Frank Kritzer was a Nazi spy and, Oh, you that's know, what they, I mean, know. that's, oh, so what's yeah, new, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. same old, same old. But, old. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, so George Van Tassel said, fine, I'm not going to do any more spaceship conventions, but the contact continued and uh, the, the project of the Integratron continued and it was Howard Hughes that was the money man behind the um, Integratron and, you know, in the early uh, 70s, late 60s, early 70s, that Howard Hughes uh, gave George Van Tassel $350,000 to build the Integratron, which was a kind of a, a like a time machine of sorts, um, but it also was a, kind of a cross between a, a a med bed and a, a time machine where they would walk in one door and uh, the, the top of the Integratron um, had a track in it that would spin and yeah, it would create this Tesla type energy uh, that would that affected the body so that you walk in one door and walked out 
you know, walk through kind of a maze-like thing and walked out the back door, you would be completely healed. All of your DNA would be cleaned and charged to be like you were a brand new baby. And, uh, you know, the, any effects of aging, any, any disease uh, it was completely taken away from you. And, uh, you know, the story goes that George Van Tassel was working on this and he was about 85% done with it. And he, at this time, he had moved a, uh, mobile home onto the property there in Landers, California on Bellevue Road. And he and his wife lived there while he constructed the Integratron, which by the way. So that was real. I would have loved, wouldn't you love to have seen that? I've, I've got to look that up again. I, that is just so cool. <laughs> I, I actually saw it when it was being built. I remember seeing the the skeleton of, you know, oh. the, of, of of the dome and you know and my mom talking I was I was a surly teenager at that point I'd rather sit in the car and listen to rock and roll than go over and talk to George Van Tassel but at some point my mom was taking so long so I got out and I was able to go over to the Integratron and uh, you know hear some of the explanation of it from George Hassel. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the whole thing is that George was testing of uh, the, uh, men in black showed up and, uh, you know, he, his wife looked out and said, you know, something was, was happening uh, something happening and she went out there and he was in full cardiac arrest and by the ambulance out there to the Integratron George Van Tassel had passed from a, a sudden heart attack so that was basically the end of it but it was Uh-oh. I don't think they want, they want us to talk about this anymore. I think maybe we better end maybe. this session and maybe we'll do another one yes, because um, before we get completely shut down here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wow. We tried doing this the other day and it didn't work. So maybe we should move <laughs> while we're ahead because we've gotten this great hour. Uh, I, I really enjoyed sharing. I had the experiences that I had and uh, Again, it was nice of you to let me come on out to Sedona all the time looking for um, uh, answers to their questions. And I want them to know that Melinda Leslie does do, still do her. Oops. Oh, we better. I don't know why. It's well, 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 we just like we better that. get off now because it's doing it again. But anyway, yeah. um, I, and I'm, I'm so bummed because I was in Sedona a few times in the last six months and I was supposed to be coming this coming weekend and then I'm not coming because I can't because I'm going to another conference here. But anyway, you are just wonderful. I'd love to have you come back on and just talk more yeah. about it. You're just a wealth of information. It's so fascinating. I love that era. My dad knew Eisenhower and was, you know, at War with Warner von Braun at 1951 oh. at Area 51 for one whole day. And he's went back five or six more times and talks about what it was like going down those, those dark, you know, all those many stairs and saying, keep your trap shut and just the fascination of seeing a few ETs and um, some of the, uh, another crash that happened in 1956 that people hadn't really heard about and seeing a few alien blood cup alive and one path don't have passed but anyway thank you jocelyn for all these all this is incredible thank and you. this is crazy too I, I forgot that when i was uh i used to have my i had rugs that i made in indian hong kong and i had them all over the country and i was down in um la one time at the blue whale and i was sitting outside sketching and a guy came up to, was sitting next to me having coffee and i was waiting for somebody uh, jody kukie who was head of i think she was senior vice president of paramount at the time or universal, I can't remember which one. And and he said, what are you drawing? I like your drawings. And I said, well, I'm, I'm an artist and a designer and stuff. And he said, 
you know, I'm, gonna, I'm about to start a 50th anniversary for Walt Disney and all the Disney caricatures, would you, characters, would you ever be interested in flying back down here when you're down here next, next month? And I, I, he was head of merchandising then at the time. So I spent about three months doing Woody Woodpecker, Donald Duck, sheets, bedding, towels, wow. furniture. I mean, oh my God. And then after about a year of co coming up with, and I was working at NASA at the time, I had 10 students. I was teaching at the Academy of Art College and I had a bunch of interns with me and I was at other paid designers there with me, but I was my Mary Edwards design. And it was really cool to be able to work on. I dated a guy named Tommy that was at one of the Musketeers when I was at college in Boston. So I walked in, I saw his Musketeer hat and I said, were you a Musketeer anyway? So, I mean, there, were, there was always sort of a little history of um, and for fascination, of course, of all of us at Walt Disney. I worked on a house in, uh, did it, I'm an interior designer too, and worked on a Disney house in um, it, Lake Tahoe and a friend's house was was right next to, it was a called Pink Lady designed by that he had lived in. So it's, I mean, it's just who doesn't love, you know, Walt Disney and those stories. And then that property that you have and the, the, the stories that you have are just priceless. So anyway, we're going to stop the recording now before somebody beeps us off again. And thank you again. You're just a gem, uh, big heart and smart and wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today and, and look forward to the next time. Thank you. Yes, right. I look forward to. Okay. Right. Talk to you thank later. You. Take care, everybody.